And I'm going to give you a quick overview of what is concrete overlay, what is the current practices, and, and uh, what are the choices or considerations that you need to put into place in order to deploy these resurfacing strategies. So what is concrete overlays? Concrete overlays should be considered as a uh, resurfacing strategies that, uh, in essence, what, what it is is um, you're building a new, fresh, concrete uh, surface course on existing pavement. And that existing pavement can be asphalt, uh, composite pavement, or concrete pavement. At the end of the day, what, is, what we're trying to do with this uh, strategy is to extend the surface life of this existing concrete pavement from 15 to 40 plus years. Depends on the type of the overlay or the applications. And you'll see the picture here showing the, uh, the, the current, oh, showing the current guide to uh, concrete overlay for addition. This is included in the USB that I have given to you. Now in terms of concrete overlays, there are two, two types. One is unbonded, one is bonded up concrete overlays. In terms of bonded concrete overlays, what it is is basically you are you're constructing a thinner new concrete layer and bond it to the existing pavement to form the structural layer at the top to carry the loads. So the bonding between the new layer, concrete layer, to the existing, whether it's an asphalt or concrete, are very critical. It has to be bonded into a monolithic layer. But in terms of the unbonded, basically you're constructing a new concrete layer on the existing concrete pavement with one inch in general separation layers, you're using the existing concrete pavement as a base to support the new layer of concrete pavement. That is the differences. And also in the bonded concrete overlay or even in the bonded cases, uniform support is very critical and I'll go into more detail. Now, what is the consideration of differences when, in terms of when and when you apply different technology, there's two different type of uh, overlays as a resurfacing strategies. In bonded uh, scenario, you're looking at this as a preventive maintenance and minor rehabilitation strategies. And you are basically putting that new layer bonded to existing pavement when the existing pavement is still in good to fair structural conditions. Now, the unbonded one is it's a strategy to address existing pavement uh, that are in minor or major rehabilitation. Means the pavement is already in poor to, uh, uh, to the deteriorated conditions. Now both strategies are there to raise or increase the low carrying capacity, extend the pavement service life, as I mentioned earlier, somewhere between 15 to 40 years, depends on the type of overlays and also the application and the traffic, and also address all the surface defects in terms of crackings, uh, smoothness, and the skip resistance, and also at the same time addressing the, the friction requirement and the noise requirement. Come on in. Okay. Now there are many, uh, the benefit of the concrete overlays, uh, there are many, the thousands of concrete overlays has been constructed in US and quite a few of them has been done in Canada. All these concrete overlays has shown this, this strategy in terms of resurfacing uh, the existing concrete pavement. It's a very cost effective way to extend the life and also at the same time incorporating or using your existing pavement as part of the assets to support or, uh, or increase the low carrying capacity of the new pavement. At the same time, it can be constructed very quickly. I know most, most of you think in concrete takes a 28 day to get the strength. Uh, yes, it does take 28 day to get the compressive strength, but in terms of the opening strength of 20 megapascal for traffic, it can be achieved in as little as six to eight hours, which there are two cases that we'll talk about later. We'll show you the result, the actual testing result. And they are very easy to maintain. Most of the concrete overlay or uh, 
does not require any major maintenance. And you look at the, um, the Blue and Auckland and also look at the, uh, the Sprex Road constructions. And also at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, it can serve as a complete preservation solutions. In this case, including the preventive maintenance, minor and major rehabilitations. So in terms of thinking about we shave and pave with the asphalt, maybe you should start thinking concrete overlay as one of the resurfacing strategy that can be considered to see whether you can get better and longer performance than the shave and pave using the asphalt. Now, another other sustainable benefit of concrete overlay is, as I mentioned earlier, utilize the existing assets that you have, which is the existing pavement, as either the integral part of the structural element at the top or as a strong base supporting that uh, new concrete layer in the embonded scenario. Also, at the same time, because the less rolling resistant of the uh, hot surface of concrete pavement, you have less truck fuel saving. There are many studies has been done by National Research Council and also in the state showing that the truck fuel saving can amount somewhere between three to seven percent annually, and also reduce potential for hydroplaning. And because of the high albedo of concrete, also reduce the lighting requirements. And at the same time, concrete pavement has been shown time and time again as the lowest life cycle cost. MTO has adopted the life cycle cost alternative bit uh, uh, principle since 2002. And since then, over 14 to 15 uh, alternate bit has been tendered. And the last one just opened on February the 9th on 401 near the uh, Highway 10 area, concrete came in lowest in first cost and also first lowest in life cycle cost. Now this graph shows a typical pavement's performance curve from construction to end of life. During this period, there's a couple strategies that you need to look at. Obviously, the pavement preservation, the preventive maintenance and rehabilitation. If these strategies are applied at the right time, it can extend the pavement service life. But if these strategies are not being deployed properly at the right time, at the right instance, the concrete, uh, the pavement, whether it's concrete or asphalt, will continue to deteriorate. You don't want to get into the area when construct reconstruction is required. Especially today, with the shrink, with the shrinking municipal dollars, that you have to have, you have to do more for less. So concrete overlay, it's, a res it's definitely a tool that you should consider in your resurfacing strategies to address the, in this case, if you look at the bonded overlay scenario, be somewhere in this area, and the unbonded will be somewhere between in this area as one of the strategy, rehabilitation strategies and preventive maintenance to extend your service life so that in this way you can put, delay the reconstruction of the pavement, at the same time also providing the services that require to the traveling public. Now, concrete overlay has a long history. In terms of number of them that have been constructed, it's over 11,000 of them has been constructed uh, in 45 states in US. Even in Canada, we have quite a few of them has been constructed. And you will hear two of them going to be discussed later on by the two other speakers. Now let's look at what, how do you evaluate the existing pavement as a candidate for concrete overlay, whether it's for unbonded or bonded scenario, uh, applications. First thing, as I mentioned earlier, uniform support is very important. So you need to determine whether there's uniform support being provided also, at the same time, you need to determine the current distress. Distresses, are they continue to be moving or they continue to lose support? Those are the two critical areas you need to look at. Time and time again, we have concrete overlay project uh, that has been done and failed. It's not because of the technology. It's because the existing pavement has not been investigated properly to find out what are the distresses and to address those distresses before they put another layer on top. So picking the wrong project 
is sometimes detrimental. It's not just sometimes, it's always detrimental to whatever technology you're going to apply. If the base material does not withstand the current uh, distresses and continue to fail, whatever you put on top is going to fail anyway. Now, the other consideration, obviously, do I ap apply a bonded concrete overlay or unbonded concrete overlay? Then that also related to the existing pavement condition, which I will go into a bit more detail later. And also at the same time, if you do unbonded concrete overlay, in most cases, you're building a new layer of concrete on top. So if, if it's, uh, if, if it's uh, no bridges, no underpass or overpass, you don't have a problem. But if you're building an, another layer of concrete on top, that may present a problem of the clearance right by the bridges. Or sometimes municipal application is your concrete sidewall ele elevation and the catch basin. Those are they also should be considered, and those may become a constraint that we need to put into consideration. And also at the same time, to have a successful overlay, as I mentioned twice already, is we need to understand what is in the existing concrete pavement. Why, what are the causes to the distresses? What do we need to fix before we start to decide which overlay, either bonded or unbonded, should be applied? Now, one other thing that we need to do, obviously, is to do investigation on the existing pavement. First, the best is obviously is to expose the entire pavement to look at what it distresses. But in certain cases, it may not be feasible because of the traffic demand and the closure times. So you may have to look at your pavement management system to look at for the last many years, what are the repairs that has been done, what are consistently the problem, and then need to understand those problems and address those problems. And at the same time, once you understand those problems, then you can decide what is unbonded or bonded concrete overlay, which one is the best application, then you can go into determine what kind of thickness is required. As I mentioned earlier, once you determine the bonded concrete overlay is the best scenario, because now all you need is to do a thinner pavement, then you need to make sure bonding is critical. So in other words, you have to look at if it's the rutting is the problem, how much rutting, uh, uh, how much mill or uh, milling, uh, milling is required in order to remove those rutting, rutted as, uh, asphalt to provide a uniform support. In general, if you have 50 millimeter rutting or less, you don't need to do anything. Anything more than 50 millimeter, then you need to mill off the rutting, in this case, to, to provide that uniform support. And I think that if you are thinking about putting a concrete over there on existing asphalt, these are the criteria you also have to consider. And says understand how many lift of asphalt underneath. The, the critical part for this is after you mill off all the deteriorated asphalt, you still have to maintain a minimum thickness of the asphalt as a base. In general, we're looking at about 75 millimeter minimum. Good asphalt, that should be in, uh, in place before you apply any concrete overlay, either bonded or unbonded scenario. And I think obviously, based on your p uh, pavement management system, then you can look at the distresses, and the history of the construction. But at the same time, it's always need to do field verifications. In this case, it's the thicknesses of the different layer of the existing pavement to understand the, ex the structure of, of, it, uh, of, the, uh, of the layers and also at the same time come up with a strategy. If you do have to mill, them, mill some of them off, how many millimeter of asphalt as for still in place. In this case, you, need, you may need to meet the minimum requirement of 75 millimeters. And at the same time, you need also need to look at how many years that you want to extend the pavement service life. 15 years, 20 years, 40 years. The design philosophy will be based on that number of extended service life year that you require. At the same time, what what is the what do you want to achieve? What you want to achieve a smoothness, noise, or the skid resistant? You need to look at what kind of uh, textures that's required. Now, in terms of overlay design, there are many. The, the design of concrete overlay is no different than 
the design concrete pavement. You still need to know why is the traffic loading, either by ESO or by the average annual daily truck traffic. Those are the things that you need to come up with. And then also at the same time, time and time again, you need to ex understand the existing pavement condition. And also what are the repair you need to do uh, in order to come up with a uniform support, either in the bonded scenario or in bonded scenario, and what kind of thicknesses that for the new concrete layer. And I'll show you different tools that you can use to design the, uh, the thicknesses. And also what is the joint requirement. In the bonded overlay scenario, you have to map because you are bonding it to the existing uh, structure. If you are bonding it to the existing concrete pavement, you have to match the joint. If you are bonding to the existing asphalt, then you don't, there's no joint to match. In general, you want to do a very small panels. And based on the loading, you need to put load transfer across the joints in order to carry the load from one panel to the others. And most importantly, if drainage is a problem, this is a time that you can also address the, uh, the drainage uh, criteria and maybe redo the subtrains. Now, in terms of the uh, design criteria, uh, the design tool, this one also in the USB uh, memory stick I, I, I've given you. Uh, this gives you a very good um, review of what are the recommended design technique for concrete overlays. And also give you examples that you can look at how concrete overlay being designed in terms of using different software and also different steps. What are the parameters that require in order to input into different computer programs? So, you know, what I'm trying to say is, basically you can, you can learn the design technique of concrete overlay from this booklet. Now, in terms of the software, this is ECOA, stands for Bonded Concrete Overlay on Asphalt. So if you have an asphalt pavement that constantly rutted or have severe alligator cracking, so what you can do is investigate how deep this distress goes and then, and then find out, well, one thing you have to do is obviously is to do cores and find out what's the total thickness and, and also doing falling weight def deflectometer or ground penetrating radar to find out how deep the distresses go and then make sure at the end of the day, once you remove those distress layer, you still have a minimum of 75 millimeter asphalt in place. Then based on that remaining 75 millimeter asphalt, you can actually use this program online. Like you can Google and this program is online. This program is based on the latest called mechanistic empirical design method that has been developed for the last three, five years. And you can input all the parameters and will come up, suggest to you what is the concrete layer thickness. And in this case, bonding to the existing asphalt is not a problem because it's, you, there's no, because you are bonding to a sang asphalt after milling off all the distresses. But at the same time, the additional concrete layer increase the structural thicknesses of the composite layer. So in this way, you can carry more low and also at the same time address all the surface distresses that has shown up in the asphalt pavement. At the same time, it will provide require noise reduction and also um, and, uh, and uh, skip resistance. And another one which is readily available, which has, even I have used it, it's called the street pave. It's a computer program that um, um, marketed by American Concrete Pavement Association has been used. This program has been in existence for the last 25 years. Uh, it's the first mechanistic empirical design computer program um, that was available in the market. This one uh, is suitable for uh, new con full depth concrete pavement design. Also at the same time have options for concrete overlay design, either bonded or un unbonded. And then also this, I, this publication, I believe, is also in your uh, USB. If, you, if I made a mistake, then do, do call me up and I can email this public. That I forgot to include that in the USB. Let me know and uh, I can email that to you. And the other, obviously, is the most, uh, up to the most uh, 
uh, follow a design procedure in 1993 ASTO guys. In fact, this one is being replaced by the latest one, the mechanistic empirical design um, uh, guide that is currently available. Um, and, the, and the design software is called ASTO Wear, which you have to purchase from uh, ASTO. So in terms of all the design tool that I've shown here, this is very easy to, uh, you, uh, American Concrete Pavement Association, if you access their website, pavement.com, they actually has, a, has an app. You can use this program online to design your full depth concrete pavement or, or design your concrete over there, bonded or unbonded. The other one is this one. It's also online. So as you can see, tools are readily available for you to deploy and design concrete overlays. And you are not the first one using these programs, and you're not the first one that has constructed concrete overlays. Hey, hey Joe. Getting all set? Yeah, just about to finish, um, finish up this presentation. Thank you, Joe. Now, in terms of mix, mixture design, concrete is concrete. It doesn't know where there's concrete overlay uh, being put into a concrete overlay as a concrete pavement layer or bridges. All it requires is the strength that you specify. In Ontario, the most critical thing is you have to specify your, your, your pavement, concrete pavement, to class of exposure C2. Minimum 32 MPA, maximum water spend ratio 0 0.45. And with proper air and training in order to go, in order to resist the free salt durability, in order to provide you adequate free salt freezing and thawing durability, and also resistant to the ice and chemicals. At the same time, one of the key things that we need to look at is if you are putting and bond the concrete overlay on existing concrete pavement, because you now you have two different concrete. One is an old concrete, one is a new concrete. These two concrete will be expanding, contracting differently. So you have to make sure your aggregate type also similar to the existing concrete pavement. But if it's bonded to the asphalt, then you should then you don't need to worry about that. Only when you have when it's bonded to existing concrete, you need to look at the different thermal expansion, contraction of the two layer. Because choose the aggregate very similar to the old concrete that has been. Uh, aggregate that has been used. In this case, min minimize the differential uh, expansion and contractions. So in this case, minimize the protection for crackings. Oh, and our thing is, it doesn't matter what type of overlay you are, do you are specifying, either bonded or unbonded. Your aggregate maximum coarse aggregate size should be no more than <coughs> one third of the overall overlay thickness. In terms of overlay construction, concrete is concrete. Pa concrete pavement is no different. The construction technique for concrete overlay or con full depth concrete pavement deploy the same construction techniques. So but in, if you are bonding it to an asphalt, it's a, the first thing, obviously, you have to mill off all the distresses to the sand asphalt with a minimum 75 millimeters. Then you have to power sweeping, air blasting, and water blasting to remove all the loose material. And also, most critical, also remove any oil drippings. Because any oil drippings that are still remaining in the asphalt, when you put any, any new asphalt or even concrete on it, you will, be, you will not bond to it. It will be, become a debonding, uh, debonding uh, in this area. So you certainly don't want to have it. Because if you're putting concrete on the asphalt, you're looking at a bonded scenario, you want to fully bond it to it. So make sure you remove all the uh, oil drippings, all the debris, all the, um, all the loose materials. And at the same time, by virtually doing all these, you're creating a mechanical surface to bond the new material to the asphalt. Now in terms of paving, once you prepare the surface, of the existing pavement for paving. The paving is no different than any other type of concrete pavement. You can use slip-form paving, 
or you can use fixed form. And you'll hear from the uh, Mark's presentation in Blue and Auckland that project was done with fixed form pavings. And as I mentioned earlier, very critical, avoid surface contaminations, even dripping from, uh, from, uh, from any external vehicles during the constructions. And, and, then on, and then the next two is, once the concrete pavement has been constructed, you have to make sure it's saw cut on time. Concrete, per, concrete, concrete material shrinks and expands, and if we don't saw cut it properly, just like any concrete floor on ground, saw cut is very, very critical. Saw cut is an engineer way to, to answer <coughs> to the mother nature is, we know concrete is going to crack but we are going to dictate where it cracks. So this way, it looks in a pattern way, very easy to manage. But also important is these joints, if you are sealing these joints, you know exactly how long these joints, how long is the sealing that's required. So in this way, it looks orderly and also at the same time, easy to control, easy to manage. So saw cut is, is a way of, we answer to the mother nature's saying, we engineer no concrete will crack, but we're going to go ahead of the curve to dictate where the crack is. We're going to make it very regularly at four and a half meter at this length. So in this way, we can manage the joint and we can manage the total joint sealing requirement if we have to seal the joints. And this, uh, the technology has been out, this green cut technology has been around for over 15 years. You can literally use this lightweight called soft cut cut the concrete within two hours without damaging the, the surface of the concrete. So if, if you are using these heavy machine to cut, then, they saw, then the, the contractor should continue to monitor the concrete. In the past, we always say soccer within the first 24 hours or soccer within the first 12 hours. That may not apply anymore. The contractor has to continue to monitor the, the condition of the concrete pavement. And usually what they do is they do the finger test is if they put the finger into the concrete pavement and press it, you only go in one fingers, like going one, then it's the time to saw cut. So usually that's the way they test it. So the timing of the saw cut and the depth of the saw cut are very critical. And most of the contractor in Ontario um, or uh, in Canada, as a matter of fact, if they do saw cut for concrete slabs, they all have the good experience uh, to basically stand by and, and knowing when and where to saw cut. So let's go into a couple uh, critical consideration area. Remember I mentioned in the bonded, if we put a bonded concrete layer to existing asphalt, a composite pavement, Bonding is very critical. And the, if you are bonding to existing asphalt, you don't need to match the joint. So in this case, you can dictate the saw cut spacing. But usually, the rule of thumb is no more than one and a half times the slab thickness that you put on. That is the maximum joint spacing. At the same time, if you have heard I mentioned twice already, you have to have a minimum 75 millimeter sand asphalt underneath before you just do this bond of concrete over there. At the same time, when you, let's say you have, all these criteria has been met. Now you're ready to do a slip form paving or fixed form paving. One of the key area that also will cause the concrete slip form or fixed form construction into problem is the temperature. You have to use the asphalt gun to shoot at the asphalt surface to look at the temperature. If the temperature of the asphalt surface is 48, 49 degrees C or 120 degrees C or higher, then you should not do stiff form paving or fixed form paving. Why? Because that hot temperature is going to elevate to increase the concrete mixture temperature to the point that that concrete mixture will go into a flash setting. When concrete that concrete mixture, ready mix concrete mixture going to flash setting, then you are going to end up with problems. So the, the placing temperature of that concrete layer on the existing asphalt is critical by ensuring 
the surface temperature of the asphalt is below 120 degree Fahrenheit or 49 degrees C. So in this way, it does not affect the temperature of the concrete layer being placed. And then at the same time, we want, we'll never want to put a joint under the wheel path without a low transfer device. Because if we don't put a low transfer device and the joint under the wheel path, that joint is going to have differential movement over the, over the years. The last, we all know regardless what type of concrete you're doing, curing, curing, curing is very important. To avoid premature evaporation of the moisture from the mixture into the air. If the concrete, if that concrete is not protected by curing compound or water curing, and the water moisture evaporated too fast, within 24 hours, you're going to have plastic string gauge cracks. That plastic string gauge cracks, you may not see it, but when you wet the surface of the, that concrete layer, you'll see like a map cracking. So curing is very important, regardless whether it's a concrete pavement, concrete bridge that concrete floor, curing is paramount. That curing should be in place almost immediately after the final, uh, uh, final finishing of that concrete surface. It can be in concrete, uh, it can be in a white pigmented curing compound, and the reason why pigmented is because you can see it, you can see the application. Sometimes if the application of the curing compound is not to the manufacturer's requirement, it will not effectively hold the moisture in the mixture itself. It will still let the moisture go through. So very important to have white pigment curing compound and the application should be in both directions. In this way, have a proper coverage. Or if you wanna, don't do, wanna do the white curing, pigment curing compound, you can do water curings. But the water has to be continuously supplied uh, you know to do the public hearing. Oh, wow, okay. I don't know why. Okay. Sorry, guys. I don't know what I press. Okay. So we passed this already. Okay, so I stress the curing compound is very important. And in highway application, usually white pigment the curing compound is what they use, spray on top of the concrete pavement. But, some but the other thing that you have to be very careful is on the side of the concrete pavement. That thickness is, it has to be covered with curing compound because even though you protect the top of the concrete pavement, but the side, if it's not protected, moisture can also evaporate. So the side, the thick, the side, the edge of the concrete pavement should also be protected with uh, curing compounds. Now, on the, um, so the last slide, we talk about bonded concrete overlay on asphalt and composite pavement. This slide shows bonded concrete overlay on existing concrete pavement. What are the key success? Same thing, bonding is critical. At the same time I mentioned earlier, you don't want a differential, you do not want the top layer and the bottom layer expand and contract differently. Since it's bonded, if this one goes, expand more than this one, but it's being restrained, it's going to crack. So you need to choose aggregate, in this case, to find the, mainly the coarse aggregate, and uh, in minor, the, uh, the fine aggregate, should have almost the same thermal property, similar to the existing pavement. And at the same time, because it's bonded, you have to match the joint. Because the existing concrete pavement has a joint, the, because it's bonded, if you have your joint here, then this joint is going to reflect all the way up. So you need to match all the joints. And also at the same time, the existing pavement, the, all the joints, in this case, the transverse joints and longitudinal joints, has to be all in fair condition. So you know, if there's any joint deterioration, you have to fix it. Otherwise, you're going to reflect all the way up. And when you do the saw cut of these um, transfer joints, you have to cut full depth of the pavement plus about 30 millimeter into the existing. And then the longitudinal joint, which is uh, parallel to the direction of the traffic, the traffic going this way, 
this joint will be half of the thickness of the overlays. And again, curing is very important. It has to be timely and adequate and, and properly supervised. And the white pigment in the curing compound being used has to be the right thick coverage uh, for the concrete pavement itself. Now, on the unbonded scenario, uh, if you put unbonded concrete over there, over asphalt or composite pavement, what are the key to success? Mentioned earlier, if it's in asphalt, if, it, if less than two inch, less than or equal to 50 millimeter rutting, you don't need to do any uh, milling. Because when you pour, when you do the slip on painting, the concrete mixture will fill the gap. And this way, put, will even that out to provide the uniform support. But if it's more than two, uh, 50 millimeter, then, then even with the, if it's more than 50 millimeter, you don't want to use the concrete to fill the void because concrete is expensive. So you want to mill it off the writings. So in this way, not that you provide the uniform support and you don't use excess rain mix concrete than required. Compare, com, complete repair, isolate this joint when the structural integrity need restore. If, you, if, the, if you're doing the composite pavement, if the underlying concrete, old concrete has some joint issues, you also need to fix it. Because if not, you will also create problems for the top layers. Again, temperature. If you are doing a composite pavement, you're putting a new concrete and bond a concrete over, overlay, on top of the asphalt, again, you have to watch for the temperature. Because that temperature of the asphalt will cause the concrete to have elevated temperature and cause flash setting, and it will cause problem in this concrete layers. Now, no separation you require. In this case, you'll pro uh, provide the unbonded concrete overlay directly onto the asphalt. So even if the asphalt bonded to a bit of the concrete, that's no problem, even though we're designing unbonded concrete overlay. So bonding a little bit is not going to cause any problems. The only thing that, the only time when you do have to provide a separation in the unbonded scenario is when you are doing unbonded concrete overlay on existing concrete, which you'll hear from the next two case studies. Uh, they are basically this rehabilitation strategy, using unbonded concrete on existing concrete pavement. One of the key things is you have to put a separation layer. Now, there are two camps. One cam likes the geotextile. I personally like the one inch HL3, the high stability asphalt, as a separation layer. Why we use this separation layer? Because this separation layer will stop all the minor distresses that we do not want to spend any money to fix, reflecting all the way up. At the same time, this will become a strong base supporting to this supporting this concrete layer. So because of a strong base, how do you know it's a strong base? All you need to do is commission the falling weight deflectometer. Find out what is the modulus of, uh, uh, modulus of uh, rigidity at this top. Once you have that, then you can design a concrete layer. In general, this layer is usually about six, seven inches. Compared to a newly constructed pavement, looking at nine, eight, nine, ten inches, it's much thinner the, compared to full depth concrete reconstruction because of the strong base that increased the modulus of rigidities or subway modulus. Sub modulus. Now, a separation layer, as I mentioned earlier. This, uh, the separation layer we in general will be put in, in place, one inches. At the same time, we also need to pay attention. Same, same thing, the temperature. If you're paving this in middays, and the, and the, and the in one inch as for a separation layer has a temperature 49 degrees C or higher, or 100 deg 120 degree Fahrenheit, it also will cause flash setting of the concrete going to be constructed on top. So two things obviously you can do is delay the construction of the concrete overlay, or you can put water to, to cool down the, the asphalt layer. But if you do use water to cool down the asphalt layer, make sure 
when you start stiff form paving or fixed form paving with that concrete, no standing water sits there. Because that standing, standing water will be absorbed by the concrete material, raising the water cementing material ratio. In this way, in this case, will lower the concrete strength. So you may not meet the C2 requirement, which is minimum 32 MPA. Um, so very important. I personally uh, would delay the paving until later in the day when the asphalt temperature drops. And cleaning, as I mentioned earlier, is very important that you need to remove all the debris, all the oil drippings, and also all the uh, irregular surface uh, items from the existing pavement top so that when you lay the new pavement, you'll end up with a uniform support. Otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, standing waters, you'll become a debonding, not you will debond, you'll, you'll reduce the concrete layer's strength because you will increase the water cementing material ratios. So uh, as in conclusions, concrete overlay is a proven resurfacing strategies that you should have it in your toolbox. And then knowing all the requirements, you should be able to determine when and where to apply this technology with the bonded or unbonded uh, uh, applications. At the same time, as I mentioned in one slide earlier, have many sustainable benefits. The beauty of it is once you do this concrete overlay, you'll be able to enjoy, if it's designed properly, constructed properly, and also applied to the right pavement, existing pavement candidates, you'll enjoy many years of uninterrupted surface, surface of this pavement without any major rehabilitation need to be done. As I mentioned earlier, it depends on the application. It can be somewhere between 15 to 40 years life. With that, I thank you very much for your time.